All right. We are at the top of the hour. It is six o'clock. The Wisconsin wine guy is back on again. Looks like my hat's crooked. You're like, you know, get on the video and it looks like, you know, your things are crooked. Let me tilt it to the side a little bit. It's funny how things go opposite. So it's your Wisconsin wine guy, Laura Shelby. For those who know me as Laura Shelby, I am back again. It is Saturday night, top of the hour. We are going live to continue our discussion on the Wisconsin wines or the wines of Wisconsin. So, um, I'm going to do a sound check here to make sure that I'm able to be heard. Uh, as soon as someone comes in and let me know. But actually, I, I get a text to someone to dial in, make sure that they can hear me. So I'm going to get that response, that ping back, like they call it, that ping back here in a moment. We are live now and doing this. Let it know on all the different platforms that I'm on. So if you are watching, you can watch this in two locations. Uh, you can watch it on Facebook, my Facebook page, Wisconsin Wine Guy, or my Facebook, um, I'm sorry, my YouTube channel entitled Wisconsin Wine Guy. Two places to hear, two places to enjoy, two places to interact. Choose your platform. All right. And Wisconsin Wine Guy, you are heard. <laughs> so it, it it seems to be I I my message came through that I sent to myself on my page Wisconsin Wine Guy telling me I am heard. <laughs> All right, so that that works out great. So now again we are continuing our series on talking about the wines of Wisconsin. I got Luther in the background, you know, giving me encouragement, you know, forever, for always, for love, for all my Luther Vandross fans out there. It, so rightfully titled for tonight's thing, forever, for always, for love, you know, dealing with Wisconsin wines and drinking Wisconsin wines. Again, short recap, I've been here for quite some time in Wisconsin over 20 years, had a chance, I can say, grow up over the past 20 years into this industry and learn a lot about it. I came here as a wine snob, but I'm enjoying my time here as a true wine aficionado, enjoying wines from all over. Again, in the previous uh, video, we talked about the history. We talked about just grape growing and wine making throughout the entire Midwest. I mean, there is a huge motion, a huge thing going on in the Midwest and, and entirely, and people are completely missing out on these wines. And I'm going to take my goal with talking about Wisconsin wines is, is to take your minds back, take it back to the beginning when you were just discovering wines or just discovering new wine regions. And that's where we are and dealing with the uh, wines of Wisconsin and throughout the Midwest. It is yet to be discovered or it's undiscovered by a lot of wine drinkers out there, but it's slowly building momentum as we begin to taste through so many different wines, so many different grapes. And tonight's show is going to be about wine grapes and the styles. And then a couple of two that we have here in Wisconsin from different uh, websites where you can find out more information. You know, so again, we're talking about a industry a Midwestern wine boom that's taking place. And when we talk about that, you know, we're not talking about your typical wine grapes, but this is what makes it so amazing here in Wisconsin is because there are many different grapes and styles that are being grown, that are grapes that are being grown here and different styles of wine are being grown here. So we are a, a big pot. I'm not going to say a melting pot, but we are a, a huge, a large pot of, different wines and different wine styles. I mean, that goes anywhere. Let me get my uh, notes set up here. You know, that goes anywhere from uh, fruit wines, meads, uh, grapes that are grown here, grapes that are not grown here, you know, and that goes into when we talk about, you know, classifications. You know, I had to go through myself and put together a classification for the uh, Wisconsin wines. So that being said, let me find out what's happening here. All right. Getting all my notes here. No technology. We are all working at home these days, you know, and so we're, we're really, really putting the pressure on our technology in order to make everything run smoothly for us. So I have, you know, the computer going, I have the earpiece going, you know, I have the Wi-Fi going, you know, for another tap it here, you know, so I can see comments. So again, if you're just joining if you're joining uh, in Facebook on the page Wisconsin Wine Guy, hello, how are you? If you're joining and watching on YouTube Wisconsin Wine Guy, hello, how are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome. So again, tonight, Wisconsin Wine Talk. I'm the Wisconsin Wine Guy, self-proclaimed, 20 years, 
growing grapes, so former grape grower, former grape grower here in uh, Wisconsin. And I want to check my mic again. All right. And that so far is so good. You know, it's uh, I just heard in my ear that my, my mic decided to disconnect itself. So uh, hopefully uh, we still have some sound. You know, so if you are listening, let me know because I don't want to get into the uh, presentation only to discover later that I was pretty much talking to myself. So if you are watching, I can see people are watching. I'm getting a countdown. If you are watching, just send me a message that says, hey, we can hear you. Okay, that's all I need to know is that we can hear you. Uh, I'm going to give that about, you know, maybe two, three minutes so that I can get a response to that question. Because, again, I just heard my mic say, you are now disconnected. Technology, you got to love it. So someone please tell me that I'm simply just not talking to myself because if I am, I'm going to need to start this all over again. All right. So, again, give me a few minutes for someone to let me know that I am being heard. Anybody, somebody out there, let me know if I'm being heard. Don't be shy. Don't be shy to say, hey, I mean, yes, I'm going to know and everybody's going to know that you're listening. So don't be shy, but just simply let me know that, hey, we can hear you, Wisconsin wine guy. Go on with the presentation. Somebody. You know, uh, so usually, usually Jackie Shark is online for a little bit, you know. So uh, Jackie Shark, if you're listening, let me know if I can be heard. All right. So I am being heard. All right. Now, let's go. And to the last one, let me say thank you. And thank you for letting me know that I am being heard. I am being heard. Yes, loud and clear. Thank you very much, Gregory. Loud and clear on both the platforms. So let's get right into it. Now, as I said, we talked about the history. We talked about the wine and the winemaking throughout the entire Midwest, you know, and how there is a, a buildup, an explosion, you know, of, of great wine being made. But we're going to talk about grapes, all right? So I guess I probably should start with a classification of the winemaking, say, and Wisconsin did it for, but I believe this can even apply to the Midwest. You know, in that classification of wines and how it's being made, I do it something like this. So we have Wisconsin wines, for example, and throughout the Midwest, fruit wines, you know? So you, you can't, as I spoke before, you can't exclude fruit wines from winemaking, not only in Wisconsin, but throughout the Midwest, you know, because fruit wines, you know, pretty much started all off, as I said before, you know, one of the first wineries to start this game off with cre uh, cherry wine. Next came cranberry wine, you know, then came grapes, you know, grape wine. We're talking commercially, you know, so we cannot exclude the classification of fruit wine. And that's wines being made from Again, cherry, cranberry, just mentioned. These are two predominant fruits here in Wisconsin. We're known for that, you know, cranberries and cherries. And then you're going to have apples. Then you're going to have pears. You know, you're going to have strawberry. You have raspberry, blueberries. You know, these are all fruit wines that are made in Wisconsin. And now, they're not just only sweet wines, you know, when we talk about these fruits. I mean, the, the, it's finally crossed over into semi-sweet and dry in some of these fruits. I mean, I, I found a, in a local winery a, a dry apple wine. I believe it was made with honey crisp apples, dry apple wine. I swear to you, if you put it in a blind tasting and just tasted it, you thought you were drinking Riesling. Isn't that some of the characteristics of a Riesling? Cool. Go figure. So, you know, so don't totally exclude when it comes to fruit wine. You know, cherry wine, I might, in my fact, I myself enjoy a nice dry cherry wine. I don't go so much for a dessert cherry wine, but I do enjoy a really nice balanced uh, dry cherry wine. Not to say that the sweet cherry wines aren't good. Some made into a port star or liqueur, fantastic. You know, so again, give those a try, fruit wines. You cannot exclude fruit wines in this classification. Next, we're going to go into meat, you know, wine made from honey. I mean, mead is, is an ancient type of alcoholic beverage that's been around for centuries you know so we're doing some fantastic things with mead you can find you know spotty you know uh, uh wines made from honey or mead uh throughout the united states i mean it, it didn't like really it's not really taking hold but there's some really good wines I have a, a couple of wineries here or a few wineries now here in wisconsin you know who do a fantastic job i believe with mead you know, just off the top of my head, White Winter Winery, uh, Solu Estates, you know, doing some fantastic made with just straight uh, 
wild meat or straight honey wines or honey blended with other fruits, fruit wines, to give it a, a different complex, a different flavor. You know, so a lot of things are happening. They're dry meats. So again, let's get out of the mindset when we think about these wines. Again, we're talking about fruit wines, honey wines. I think people think they're all sweet. They're a dry version. So meat, dry and sweet, uh, honey, single, or honey blended with uh, fruits. And let's not forget, while we pick on fruit, I mean, is a grape a fruit? For all intents and purposes, grape is a fruit, right? So let's not beat down or get on top of uh, fruit wine to say that's not real wine. So the grape is a fruit. So we got classification. One, I have classified all of the fruit wines. I have the second classification of meads and mead blends. You could maybe even find some meads blended with uh, grapes. And then I have the, the next classification, and these are going to be grapes or wine grapes that are grown in Wisconsin, are grown in the Midwest. But we're more specifically talking about Midwest. I'm going to come back to that because I'm going to give you some grapes. And then I have a classification of wines that are made from grapes, wine grapes that are not grown in Wisconsin. All right. These I'm going to speak about. These are going to be the ones you already know. You know, the classical varietal, Chardonnay, uh, Cabernet, uh, Merlot, Pinot Noir, and the list goes on and on. These are all that you already know. We have winemakers who are making fantastic wines from those grapes and doing fantastic blends, blending those grapes, uh, classic varietals, blended with the new varietal grapes. I'm not going to use that H word. Forget that H word. They're all wine grapes. And for those who know what the H word is, you'll thank me for it. They're all wine grapes. But let's talk more specifically about the grapes that are being grown here in Wisconsin. We like to call them cool climate grapes. Cool climate grapes. So what is that? Well, these are grapes that can withstand our cold, cold, frigid winters. I mean, in the first part, I talked about Augusto Harassi, you know, the Hungarian immigrant who tried to grow, and many people after him, I'm talking about the 1800s, and many people after her, uh, Augusto tried to grow the classic varietals. It just didn't take. You know, the, the, the vines, the classic varieties are just not strong enough, nor not hard enough to withstand our winters. You, know, you, you got to be tough in, in Wisconsin. You know, I, I'm still trying to build my Wisconsin bones here with winter and winter's winning. <laughs> so now, so what happened was grapes were developed by, you know, great breeders that, are, that were in Wisconsin. And you know, we're talking through the 60s and 70s and the 80s and 90s and the 2000s that great breeders, who, great breeders who were committed to breeding grapes that would do well in not only Wisconsin's climate, but the climates throughout the Midwest. So they, they put together these grapes. And again, I'm speaking specifically about Wisconsin and what's grown here. Now, you see behind me, last week I talked about my poster of Wisconsin wine grapes. You know, so that's what we're digging into for those who are just tuning in. So let's start with the white grapes. You know, I like to call this my, my top eight. These are the, my top eight uh, wine grapes that I recommend that you seek out, search, and give it a try. All right. When we go to part three or lesson three in the series, we're going to talk about, you know, regions, you know, and differences. But my top eight in my top eight. So the four whites are going to be uh, Frontenac Gris. Ever heard of that? Well, let's back this up. Remember when you didn't know what a Chardonnay was or someone came to you and said, oh, I'm drinking Riesling and, and you thought that was the name of the wine, not the grape? Or how about, you know, when you purchased that wine of uh, a Sancerre or you purchased a Beaujolais or you purchased a, a Chianti? You didn't know what the grapes were. Those were things that you learned over time. And also with that learning, you began to gain an appreciation for those grapes. So this is where we are again, and that's what makes wine drinking so fun and, and, and so interesting because you get to always continuously learn more and more all the time. So again, white grape. We're talking about Frontenac Gris. Frontenac Gris is a, is a, gre a grape that was bred. It's part of the red grape Frontenac, but this is a grape that was bred. Gris meaning gray, just like Pinot Noir, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Blanc. Get it? You're starting to get the connection. So Frontenac Greek was a grape that was bred uh, in the, at the University of Minnesota. This is one of those grapes that were bred to withstand our cold, cold climates in the Midwest. 
hence the name cool climate or cold climate grapes. All right, so Frontenac grape has characteristics of peach, apricot, uh, citrus, tropical fruit, nice refreshing acidity. Here's something else you should know. When we talk, we're gonna, I'm gonna mix styles in with them, with the talk about the grapes. When we talk about the grapes in Wisconsin, you know, we are cooler, cooler region, all right? So our grapes aren't gonna get that huge deepness of fruit. We're gonna have a nice, crisp tasting wine, you know, whether it be reds or whites. We're gonna get some depth, we're gonna get some color, but we're, gonna get a, we're gonna get a very lively tasting wine when it comes to our reds and white wines. So you're thinking more along the lines of some old, old world European styles. You know, before the wines, before it became warmer <laughs> in some of those areas, it was all cool. So very crisp, very bright, very refreshing tasting in both reds and whites. So this is where we are. You see what's happening here? You know, you're going to start going back into your wine drinking database. And when you're tasting these wines, you think, oh, my God, this reminds me of this area, that area. So next on the list is going to be St. Pepin. All right. So let's go back. Frontenac Gris. F-R-O-N-T-E-N-A-C and Gris. G-R-I-S, all right, St. Pepin. Now, St. Pepin is a grape that was uh, bred here in Wisconsin. So, Project Green, Minnesota, St. Pepin bred here in Wisconsin by Elmer Swinson. You ever heard of the uh, uh, Louis Swinson grape? And various others. So, Elmer Swinson, you know, created this grape, or bred this grape, St. Pepin. Now, flavor profile, green apple, lemon, peach, apricot, honey, floral, citrus, spice, doesn't that sound like something else? It's amazing how these flavor characteristics begin to all sound alike, but in the hands of the winemaker, it's something extraordinary is produced in the bottle. So St. Pepin, uh, P-E-P-I-N. In fact, there's a, a, a town or a city in Wisconsin called St. Pepin, in which St. Pepin grapes are grown there in a winery. Here's a shout out to Villa Belisa, you know, doing some fantastic things with the St. Pepin grape. All right, so style-wise, St. Pepin, originally when St. Pepin, Pepin hit the scene, uh, people were making more sweeter wines, dessert-style wines. But here lately, in the 21st century, we're talking about drier styles. You know, it makes a fantastic sparkling wine. Oh, my God. You know, so bubbles, if you like bubbles, you got to try uh, St. Pepin in a brute style and in a semi-dry uh, style. You have to try them both. So, Makes it dry. You ever had an Orvieto, Orvieto, or Orvieto Classico out of Italy? You know, it makes a very dry, crisp, citrus, refreshing wine. Well, I've had some St. Pepin's made similar to that style. So we're talking about, you know, grapes. Just because they're grapes you've never heard of, forget that. Learn, explore. So we did Frontenac Gris, St. Pepin. These are my top eight, you know, uh, grapes you need to pay attention to from Wisconsin or the Midwest. La Crescent. Another grape, another grape. In fact, a lot of the grapes in Wisconsin began their winemaking journey being made into dessert wines or sweet wines, you know, but they have since progressed. So La Crescent, that's La, L-A, Crescent, C-R-E-S-C-E-N-T, apricot, peach, citrus, all right, La Crescent, you know, uh, almost at times tasting like a Moscato, okay? So you'll find a lot of wines being made in a similar style to Moscato, made with a grape called La Crescent. But coming forward, I've tried some La Crescent that was not only dry, but also aged in oak. Very lightly aged in oak. Now, not over, not the whole buttery thing, not the whole overly smoky thing, but just very lightly to give it a nice little structure. I thought, I thought it was really nice. You know, so the progress is happening. So La Crescent is just not only a dry wine, but it's also a sweet wine as well. Or a sweet wine, but it's also a dry wine as well. It can be made to that style. And Brianna. Now, Brianna, B-R-I-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, just like the name. Tropical fruits, apple, and pear. Let me turn this off.
unmute. Okay. So I just unmuted my mic here. All right. All right. So we're we're back. We're back in motion here. Now we left off at Brianna before things went silent. So Brianna, B R I A N N A, just like the name Brianna. You know, also uh, bred here in Wisconsin. So created here in Wisconsin. Another cool climate or cold climate. Great tropical fruits: apple, pear, citrus. I've had some Briannas that totally reminded me of drinking a nice, very nice, balanced, crisp apple, citrusy Pinot Grigio. I've also had it in a sweeter style. You know, I mean, so again, the styles just range. And I think uh, someone here in Wisconsin is producing Brianna into a sparkling wine style as well. Again, so again, explore the different styles. I always say to people, you know, first thing is get to know the grape. Second thing, explore different styles because you'd be surprised at what style you like made from that particular style of wine you like made from that particular grape. So we just did our, my top four in white that you should pay attention to, Frontenac Gris, St. Pepin, La Crescent, and Brianna. Now for the red grapes. You know, a lot of people are drinking red wine for health reasons or they're just plain like red wine. Cabernet Reign Supreme, you know, uh, Merlot, you know, Pinot Noir. Since the movie Sideways, you know, but a lot of good grapes out there. But you know what? There's a lot of good grapes being made here in Wisconsin from grapes. Again, I got my grape poster right behind me, you know, so it, it exists. And it amazes me when people find out that there's still, that there are growing grapes here in Wisconsin or that there are growing grapes throughout the Midwest. Isn't that amazing? So here we go. So Frontenac. Frontenac is the red version of the white grape Frontenac Gris. All right, so Frontenac gives you grapes, uh, flavors of cherry, black currant, red berries, herbaceous or herbs, red peppers, little chocolate, medium tannins, and moderate acidity. Now, the Frontenac, in fact, for myself, was one of the first grapes that I grew. Frontenac, you know, and in fact, that was probably the second grape that was being grown here in red here uh, in Wisconsin. And, and from my recollection of how it began to discover the grapes that are already here grown versus what was coming into uh, Wisconsin. So Frontenac, you know, uh, bred out of Minnesota. All right. So you can find this not only just in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and various other places throughout the Midwest. I gave you the characteristics, you know, Make some remarkable wines you know, as far as style goes. I've had it in the sweet style. I've had it with blends, blended with, you know, Cabernet or Merlot. Uh, I've had it uh, in a dry style, in a full body red. In fact, the wine we're going to be drinking tonight, as I told you in the previous show, I got a lot of older bottles because one of the things you had to find out can these wines age? It's always the question can they age? But this is called Vintner's Reserve from Parallel 44. And this was uh, probably the first. You know, uh, estate blended wine, in my opinion, from Parallel 44 in red. And this was made from all of the grapes that they grew red at the time. And that was, uh, let's see, uh, Frontenac, Foch, uh, St. Croix, and I believe some Baco Noir is all a part of this. And there may be one white grape in here. I can't remember. This was 2007. We'll be opening that tonight and then they get sit upright to, for the sediment to drop. And hopefully I did a good job in resting it and taking care of it. Uh, since 2008. We'll find out. So the next grape in red in my top eight is going to be Marquette. M-A-R-Q-U-E-T-T-E. -E, Marquette. Now, Marquette lean, it, that was bred in Minnesota. You know, that is probably uh, one of the most popular grapes here in Wisconsin. You know, uh, I would say it probably even has now surpassed its popularity uh, with Frontenac. So Marquette, that has a lineage connected to Pinot Noir. In fact, the styles of this wine, it gives you the characteristics. Medium to firm tannins, cherry, berry, black pepper, and spices. All right? That's on its own. And so imagine what happens when it's oak age. You know, so I've had it in various different styles. I had it in a semi-sweet style. I had it in a sweet style, more like a dessert. I had it like, uh, in a dry style, un-oaked. I had it in a dry style, oaked. You know, so again, it runs the gamut. In fact, it almost has similarities to a Pinot Noir, depending on the style and the winemaker and what they're trying to achieve. Now, here's something I want you to understand. We're not trying to make the wines taste like the grapes that you already know. We're making the wines with an expression of 
Wisconsin's climate, Wisconsin's soil comp comp uh, compilation, uh, <laughs> composition. <laughs> I, I think I had too much wine earlier. Composition. So Marquette, medium to firm tannins, cherry, berry, black pepper, and spice. Next up is going to be Marshall Fulch, named as a general. General Fulch, right? So Marshall Fulch. Now its roots trace back to France. In fact, all these great these grapes have a a connection to French grapes, right? But the Fauche, F-O-C-H, has a direct connection from France. In fact, it was once upon a time a very popular, popularly planted grape in France, Fauche, in the Loire Valley. So the flavor profile, black fruits can be cherry, a tart cherry, you know, uh, chocolate, soft tannins, you know, uh, cranberry. So this reminds me of like a Beaujolais. And what is a grape in Beaujolais? Gamay. Just a nice, fruity, easy drinking, you know, uh, type of wine. But in the hands of a, of a crafty winemaker can be something extraordinary. I've taken the Foch in a blind tasting with some Pinot Noirs that were similar in style. All barrel aged, blind tasted, six wines, you know. And I didn't tell anybody what the other wines were, or all the wines were. But I began to unveil the wines. And I had five Pinot Noirs. And one was the Foch. Believe it or not, the Foch, made by a local winery, uh, Volersheim Winery, was picked as number one in that lineup. Can you believe it? If you blind taste the wines and you're just simply tasting the wines on the merit of the wines itself, how it tastes, how it feels in your mouth, etc., without knowing any details of grapes, it's amazing what your palate, what, which is why I always say, let your palate be the guide right below. Let your palate be the guide. All right, so that's the Foch. So let's go do a recap here on my top eight wines, on my top eight great picks that you should pay attention to. In White, Frontenac Gris, St. Pepin, La Crescent, Brianna. Red is going to be Frontenac, Marquette, Marshall Foch, or Foch. And then there's one more, Petite Pearl. Petite Pearl came on the scene much much later i want to say probably 2010 petite pearl hit the scene you know and now that's getting a lot of attention you know there's theory that petite pearl you know as it begins to mature we're probably maybe at a planting here in wisconsin and this was out of minnesota again uh i believe like 2009 uh was created but the petite pearl as it matures, and we see what's going to happen in like 15, 20 years when the vines mature in our soil and how it develops, that it probably can rival, you know, some Syrahs. You know, we may, we may or may not get the, the fruit depth, but as far as the, the flavor profile, you know, uh, it just may come close. And in that, we're talking about, you know, it's, it's dark inky, or maybe Petite Syrah, dark and inky. Blackberries, black currants, peppers, spices, tobacco, you know, red fruits, medium tannins. You know, yeah, there's a lot of complexities going on with it. You know, so Petite Pearl. So reds again for all you red lovers. Frontenac, Marquette, Petite Pearl, and Foch. Must give those grapes a try. Must seek out those wines. You know, and now let's give you a little bit of resources. But while I do that, I'm going to open this wine. Again, I said this wine is probably Vintner's Reserve. And the grape composition here, I said, was the plantings at Pale of 44's winery in Kiwani. The grape composition, Baco Noir, Frontenac, St. Croix. Uh, let's say Baco Noir, Frontenac, St. Croix, and Foch. And I think there's a white in there. And if it's a little white in there, it's probably La Crosse. I'm not too sure. That was a long time ago. And this was... This is like a new experiment. Oh, we had this happen before, breaking the cork off into wine. So we get another lesson, opening up the bottle of wine with the cork, and if you don't have one of those little side pin things. So again, nice and easy, at an angle, at an angle, nice and easy, so you don't push the cork in, all right? And give it a screw, but don't push that cork in. Just get it in there and make sure the cork isn't gonna touch the wine. You can see the wine here. Make sure the cork isn't going to touch the wine. And then slowly pull that out. Look at it. Here it comes. Screw it in. Slowly pull that out. I mean, so don't fret if you break the cork in the bottle. And if you were to do that, you can always decant. Wow. 
This has been sitting in there while that cork is falling apart. This would be a, a good candidate for decanting. I want to give you a look at the bottom of that. And let me tell you something. It smells phenomenal. Wow. Check out check out the bottom of that of that cork. Oh my God. So that's always a good sign when you pull that cork out. Here's the broken cork. When you get that cork out and it smells good. You know, it has a very beautiful color. Let's get it off of the corkscrew. Now think at that again. Very, very beautiful color. So here's the cork. You know, the top part of the cork, here's the bottom from sitting in the bottle. As you can tell, I laid this bottle down. It is still nice and moist. Now, I'm not going to decant, but I'm going to use my trusty Hades corker. You know, Hades corker has a screen in it for filtering. It's going to give you a little aeration. And I'm going to pour this up in two glasses, you know, my universal tasting glass. Now, this wine is a lot lighter in color than when I originally had it. And then I'm going to pour it in my deep, bold red glass. Okay? Now, so I'm going to taste it in both. So I'm going to get a real experience here. Now, let's get a look at this color. Now, we have a colored wine that is more garnet color and a little bit of orange hues along the rim, but still, you know, decent color. All right? Now, when you're looking at it in the camera, you just see a dark burgundy, a dark purple color, a burgundy color, ruby colored wine. But it's not like that, you know, in the real world. So now let's give it a nose. The nose smells great. So good sign. This wine has traveled with me. I will tell you this. When the wine was originally made, it was made into a semi-dry style. Right? First experience, first expression. Again, back, even back then, there was still a lot of wineries that were still making, you know, some wines or red wines in a more semi-sweet or semi-dry style. All right, that nose smells great. So it held up in the bottle. That was something I mentioned, I've mentioned quite a few times, is being able to taste some of these Wisconsin wines that are older, because it's always a question. Does, can it age really well? Does it have the, the capacity to age for any length of time? As I said, this, we're talking 2008 here. Last week, uh, I did a 2011 or 2012 Riesling from Stone's Throat. So I did. I purchased a lot of these wines, and I kept them on hand for moments like these to share them with you first time. Ah, Now, I like the nose better. In my tasting glass, because it's more concentrated. Look at it. It's more concentrated. Now, this is just area. I'm going to taste the wine as it aerates more, which is why I decided to use a big bowl. Now, when I swirl it, you can get a look at what that color is truly like. All right? Kind of more like, like a, a reddish amber or brick red color to it. Amber color. All right? For the rinse. Now, what I look for is acidity. Whether it's a young wine and an older wine is acidity. My mouth is watering. Watering. Wow. So acidity is still there. Ripeness of the fruit, still there. Very clean tasting. It's almost like it didn't even age. I will tell you this. Upon first having this wine, when I first had this wine, the sweetness was like right there. Boom. It was right off the gate. You knew it was a sweeter wine. But as it had time to balance out, there's more of a fruitiness to it. You know, it's now a lot more mellow. It's a lot more balanced, a lot more friendly, you know, but the acidity is, is crisp. I mean, it aids pretty well in this bottle, you know, with a blend of these grapes. So this is Parallel 44, Parallel 44, Vintners Reserve Semi-Dry Red Wine. Now, they do a current Vintners Reserve, which is along the driest style, you know, and that is a blend of two grapes. I believe that current one is maybe Marquette and Petite Pearl. Don't quote me on it. You can check it out on, the, on their website. But we're tasting the 2008 version of the Vintners Reserve, the very first Vintners Reserve. In fact, this is the last bottle. I, I talk with the winery. Do you guys have any left over, you know, in your own private cellar? This says one of 115, all right? One of 115 bottles that were made in that year. And I'm probably opening up the last one on earth, all right? So let's give it another taste. That was my rent. Mm. Wow. 12%, 12.5% alcohol. It's like almost 13% alcohol. I love the way that feels in my mouth. It, it's really, it's really and truly like drinking a Chianti, an Italian red. Really and truly, or even drinking a Moujoulet. 
really and truly. I mean, I, I think this did very well, you know, in aging. And it's a shame this is the last bottle. I'm going to have to keep this bottle just for a keepsake. And, uh, but I think it did an excellent job in aging. And I said, I did an excellent job in taking care of it since 2008. So now let's taste it out of the big bowl with a little bit more air and see what happens. Let's do a rinse. Oh, wow. With a lot more air added to it, it's almost silky. It's almost like drinking a Pinot Noir, almost like an organ Pinot Noir. Oh, my. This is nice. I can feel the tannins. Again, not killer tannins, but it's adding a very nice structure to it. I think I feel, I think I feel the wine aged very well. It's a lot lighter now, a lot more balanced, a lot more, not as tight or not as sweet as what it was before, but I, I think it aged very well. So if you are looking to try the Vintner Reserve, you must try the current vintage of Vintner Reserve, you know, from Parallel 44, and I'm going to enjoy this one here. And now to give you some information on tools here. So if you want to learn more about local wine grapes, you know, or, or Midwestern wine grapes and or Wisconsin wine grapes, you know, you can uh, tap into the University of Minnesota's grape growing or grape breeding program. Check out, check out their website. But here in Wisconsin, we are doing it with the Wisconsin Grape Growers Association. So Wisconsin Grape Growers Association here in Wisconsin talks about, they have a little pamphlet, brochure, their website talks about the many different grapes that I've mentioned here. And also they have this, I don't know if they still have this, but this was a nifty wheel that they did uh, uh, years ago. And this wine wheel, it's called, it talks about the different grapes and talks about pairings. So let's do, for example, here the Marquette. All right, we have the Marquette grape here. And we have, we go to the Marquette grape. We find, oh, there it is, Marquette grape. It talks about, tells you how to pronounce it. Talks about when it came into existence, 2006, complex, ruby color, tannin structure, cherry, dark berries, spice, full body, rosé, port style, dry to sweet. You know, very simple. Now we go, that's on this side about the grape. Now we go to the flip side and we talk, look at, okay, what can I have with it? Let's talk about pairing. So we go to Marquette. Goes great with grilled beef, lamb, or veal in red sauce, pastas, grilled meaty fish. You know what? I think this is going to grow great with uh, pasta or maybe even enchiladas. Uh, cheeses, you got to have cheeses. And we do a lot of cheese in Wisconsin. So feta, brie, mozzarella. Ooh, probably a nice warm mozzarella with some nice crusty bread would be great. Uh, Gouda, provolone, Swiss, uh, American grana, and Saxon creamery. Oh, which does a nice Gouda. So, again... I want you to go out and explore the grapes here throughout in Wisconsin, if you're in Wisconsin. And if you're just around the country, you can visit the Wisconsin Winery Association. There, I believe it's wisconsinwines.com, so Wisconsin Winery Association. I'll put the links at the bottom of the video when I'm finished, so you can visit those and explore the different wineries. We're right now in lockdown 2020, so explore the wineries. Uh, the, most of the wineries ship throughout the United States. If you want some winery recommendations, recommendations you can always uh, send me a message and I can give you a recommendation of what wineries uh, to check out, you know, to explore, to get you a good picture of Wisconsin wines. So again, short recap, wine classifications, fruit wine. You can't exclude fruit wines from, from any wine industry from the Midwest, but especially in Wisconsin, fruit wines. Meads. Wine, uh, wine made from grapes grown in Wisconsin, wine made from grapes that are not grown in Wisconsin. And there's quite a few wineries in Wisconsin doing some fantastic things, uh, winning fantastic awards, you know, for the wines that have been made from not only the classic varietals that you know, but also from the cool climate grapes that we see in Wisconsin. Oh, my God, this is, this is smelling so good. Recap on the grapes. White grapes, my top eight picks. Frontenac Gris, St. Pepin, La Crescent. Brianna, that's in white. Uh, uh, the reds are going to be Frontenac, Marquette, Petit Pearl, and Fauche. Now, there's, again, a host of other grapes. There's uh, Baco Noir. There's Idlewise. I mean, some of these you may even know. You know, there's uh, Lacrosse. There's Louis Swinson. 
there's so many grapes. There's uh, Traminet, which is a crossbred with Gewürztraminer and another grape. You know, so there's so many grapes here for you to try. Explore, let your palate be the guide, and step outside your box. Remember, I said earlier, once upon a time, you never even know, never even knew what a Chardonnay or a Cabernet or a Merlot or a Pinot Noir or a Riesling or a Sangiovese or a Petit Syrah, Sauvignon Blanc, you name it. You never knew what those wines, what those grapes were before, but you tasted, you explored, and you found a style that you enjoyed. You found the area that produces certain styles from those wines that you enjoy. I say the same thing here with these grapes. Explore. And as always, let your palate be the guide when selecting your wine. And I'm going to see you next time when we conquer part three in this series next Saturday. Until next time, ciao. Oh. Mm. I'm going to enjoy this. Bye.